Good morning and welcome to the Pastor's Corner. This is your host, Pastor Dr. Wayne Baker, bringing you uh, the Pastor's Corner. We believe to be the inspired word of God. Now we're going to continue on from last week. We studied uh, 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, and today we're going to begin with the 25th verse. So I'm wanting you to get your Bible, and always, when I, I'm a teacher, and uh, I believe I'm an anointed teacher. I've been to school for this. I have a, a BS, a master's, a master of divinity, and a doctorate degree. It's not fantasy, it's earned by respected colleges and universities. I, I came from respected colleges and universities. I earned them there. And so I don't ever play, uh, I don't mess around with my qualification. I believe I'm well qualified to teach you and uh, to deliver the messages that God has entrusted with me with delivering. So, but I want to tell you about our uh, summer camp. Mrs. Baker, that's my wife, she is in charge of summer camp. And you can call her at 706-763-9999. And for a small fee, your kids can be enrolled at Spirit Field Summer Camp. We have a gym somewhere for the kids to play. Uh, boys like to play basketball. Girls like to dance and play with their dolls and what have you. But it's something for everyone to do. We have water day where they will get the uh, pipe, the hose pipe, and they will just play in the water as kids do. So if you have not a place, if you have not considered a place for your children, then I want you to consider uh, Spirit Field Summer Camp. That's 706-763-9999. We're going to have a great time. Well, let's pray um, over this scripture before we go through them. Heavenly Father, uh, you know how much I enjoy bringing the pastor's corner uh, to your people. I want you to bless this and bless everybody out there in the audience. Uh, people are going through things, Heavenly Father. And uh, money is getting tight, but I want you to bless them anyway. Let them know, Father, that their source is not the government. Their source is not uh, the mayor. It's not the counselors. It's you. You are their exceedingly great reward. The same thing you told Abraham. So, Father, we don't look to government. We look to you, the author and finisher of our faith. In Jesus' name, amen. Now we, we're going to uh, <clears throat> take off at verse 25. For he must reign. Who must reign? Jesus Christ. He is the one that must reign. Till he hath put all enemies under his feet. Now one thing I like. I like the song that says it's under his feet. The storms are under his feet. That's taken from the 14th chapter of Matthew. Where was the storm? It was under his feet. What was Peter? He was above the water, but the storm, the water, was under the feet of Jesus. Let me just say this. Wherever you go, whatever you do, I want you to remember that it is under the feet of Jesus. If you are in the Atlantic Ocean and you have no flares, you have no light boat, and you're about to go under, I want you to remember it's under the feet of Jesus. Now, I don't know what Jesus will do, but I know what he is able to do. He is able to make the storm disappear. And if you, today, if you are having problems with your children, and if you're having problems in your home, I want you to remember that it's, it is under the feet of Jesus. In just a little while, people, I know some of us are having problem with politicians and the community. It doesn't matter. It, it's just a, a little while when God's going to come and he's going to mete out justice. You see, one of the attributes of God is his justice. Amos said, let 
just as flow like a mighty river, and it rained down like water. So God is a God of justice, and His love clears the way. His justice balances things. So the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. I think of so many young folks that go to the death, the, the grave of their mothers. And they would ask me, Pastor, uh, does God really love me? Yes, God loves you. But these things must needs be. One of the saddest things on this earth is when a child goes before his mother or father. I've had so many of them uh, to do that. I've had to minister to so many people whose children died before they did. That's very sad because it's not supposed to happen. It's, um, it's odd that it happens, but it does. God loves you. God's going to rectify and he's going to restore you what the canker worm have taken away uh, from you. You see, sin is sin. And uh, God let sin play out. But believe me, in the end, God will win. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. And I'll be glad when death is destroyed. Why should I be glad? Why should you be glad when death is destroyed? I never forget death took my mother. I never forget that uh, one Christmas, near Christmas, I went down to my mother's house in Crawford, Alabama, and uh, Mama was she was there, but she was not there. And uh, she said to me, "said uh, uh, you can have the timber on my land." She said, "I don't need it," and Mama then had given up. I went out cry outside and I, I bawled like a baby. I just cried. I knew that was the last time. And then within three or four weeks in January, my mother died at Columbus Hospice. You see, death has a way of taking our loved ones and destroying homes. Death has spoiled our families. It's just like a little bad boy who shows up at the wrong time and acts up and cuts up all over the place. That's, that's what death is, and that's what death has done to this world. But death, as a songwriter said, as a poet said, be not proud. Uh, we have a conqueror who has conquered you. He even left his clothes folded, neatly folded, when he got out of that grave signifying that he won't need it anymore. When Lazarus was raised from the dead, one thing that Christ said, you got your old grave clothes on. Loosen, loosen, loose the man and let him go. And some of us now still have our old grave clothes on. I'm not gonna get into what it represents. It probably represents the law, probably represents Phariseeism. It probably represents death or it represents sin. But some of us are still clothed with those grave clothes on. I have a better understanding of death, folks. <clears throat> death does not faze me. You know why? Because I know that from death comes life. And you better believe that too. If you take all of uh, the Beatitudes, you'll find that it goes out. You gotta go through something in order to get something. Uh, blessed are the poor in spirit. You see, poor in spirit, for there is the kingdom of heaven. The pure in heart, why? You shall see God when your heart is pure. And so, it's under his feet. I want you to realize that. Where was the, uh, where were the storms and wind? It was under Peter's feet. But Peter took his eyes off Jesus and he focused on the boisterous wind. He focused on the storm. Keep your eye on Jesus. If you are to live through the storms of life in this life and of this world, because you're going through some storms, my people. Uh, 
for he had put all things under his feet. But when he said, all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted, which did put all things under him. And, and this is why I like uh, Hebrews, uh, the second chapter. Uh, in that God said all things are put under him, uh, the, the Bible says. We see not yet, not yet. That's the thing about it. We don't see yet all things put under Christ. And you shouldn't. But now we see Jesus. That's exactly what that scripture says. In uh, Hebrews, the second chapter, we don't see all things put under him, but we see Jesus. Let me, let me just go and read that for us because I believe this is going to help somebody today. Hebrews, the second chapter, 7 verse says, Thou made of him a little lower than the angels. Thou crowned of him with glory and honor, and didst set him over the works of thy hand. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing. He didn't leave anything, not a grain of sand that is not put under him. <laughs> That's something, folks. This, this, is, this almost makes me shout. But now we see not yet all things put under him. At some of the funerals I, I do, I preach on this subject. I eulogize people on this subject. Not yet all things put under him. We don't see all things put under him. We can't see it now because why? Life is a mystery to be lived, not a problem to be solved. And I got that uh, from Reverend Cochran uh, over at Franchise when I was a boy. He was preaching on television and he said this, I've never forgotten. Life is a mystery to be lived, not a problem to be solved. Live out the mystery, folks. Live out the mystery, the fact that God has put us here in this age and this time. I do not want to live in another era. But here is the thing I want you to see. But now we see not yet all things put under him, but we see Jesus. How do we see Jesus? Jesus made a little lower than the angels. See, if you can see Jesus in your problems, in your troubles, in your tribulation, in your oppression, then you've got it made. And that's all that we are to see in this present age. All things are put under him. It's already done. The dinner is already cooked. If you just go to the table and eat, all things are put under him but we don't see it. You see, instead, we see Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Isn't that something? People, if I can see Jesus in everything I do, that's enough for me to get over. That's enough for me to win the battle. That is enough in my oppression. There is enough in the racism that we see now coming from certain parties, from certain churches, from certain evangelicals. If we can see Jesus, then we are all right. Now, verse 28 of uh, chapter 15, 1 Corinthians. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him, that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. Now, 
A good definition of the Trinity is that there are three persons subsisting in one Godhead. I learned this in my theology classes, people. I, actually, I learned it before I went to, uh, got my doctorate from uh, theology school. The definition of the Trinity is that there are three separate beings that subsist in one Godhead. They are of equal authority, equal power, and they are one in unity of the same substance as Christ. But how in the world did Paul pin this? And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. In other words, the Trinity, how do they survive? How do they get along together? They are one. They're one in unity. You see, let me say this. How does a family get along together? We've got to be one in unity. And we're not God, you see. We're not even close to God. But if your family is to survive. You're going to be one in unity. In other words, the man is the head of the house, uh, the woman is under the man, and the children are under the man and the woman, the wife. So you got three. You got the man, the woman, and the children. That's three in one. So you got the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. They are three in, in one. And so, order is the thing that God wants. So, the Son submits to the Father, and the Holy Spirit submits to the Son and, and the Father. And um, all things are of one. And the body should be like that. That should be, that is, it should be one body. I don't care how we carry it out. Whether you're white, whether you're black, it doesn't make any difference to God. There's no such thing as a Methodist church, or a Baptist church, or a Pentecostal church, or a Presbyterian church, or a Russian Orthodox church, or a Catholic church. We are one body if you are teaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And God should be all in all. We have a, a racist thing going on. People and I talk about it. I'm going to talk about it as long as I live. Uh, and uh, the people in that land over there are not the biblical people who should be in Israel. So we got to rectify some things in our teaching. You see, God never ever uh, gave the church a new covenant. That's false, false doctrine. He gave the new revised covenant to Israel in Jeremiah 31, uh, 30, 31st verse, if I remember correctly. He said, the days, behold, the days come when I will make a new covenant. Who did he make it with? The house of Israel. And so we know that he came to save Israel, but he also, the atonement applies to those who believe in him. And this is the church. Uh, going into the kingdom of God uh, after Israel. We'll go in with Israel. Dwight Pentecost, he's a great preacher at Dallas Seminary. I don't know whether he's dead or alive now. Last time I heard he was over, over 90 years old. So uh, he wrote that Ethiopia went into the kingdom uh, after Israel, uh, with Israel, all people. Israel is God's favorite people. All of us go into the kingdom uh, after Israel. And uh, I'm not going to get into who are Israelites. I believe I'm an Israelite. Uh, because Israel had a special calling unto God. I won't get into it now. Perhaps later on I can. Um, but and when all things shall be subdued unto him, verse 28, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him that God may be all in all. 
that is order. And if you don't have this order in the church, you need it. If you don't have this order in the home, it's needed. If you don't have this order in school, it's needed. If you don't have this order in society, it's needed. It's not about your position. The, the son does not care what position he holds. The father does not care what position he holds. The Holy Spirit does not care what position he holds. They are at substance. The Holy Spirit knows his role. The role of the Holy Spirit is to work in the believer and produce the fruit of uh, Jesus. Jesus' duty is to redeem all the believers. Whosoever uh, believe in him may in him have everlasting life. Jesus' role is to make intercession for sinners like me when we sin. Uh, sinners who are sinning in the church, deacons, uh, ministers who sin. That's the role of uh, Jesus. And the Father, he is the creator, steadily creating in us, inculcating in us what heaven is like. Probably, I don't know, I'm saying this, I have no proof of it, but he's probably creating other planets. I believe that as man expand, as we get this thing right, that's coming, uh, I believe Israelites are gonna be all over the place uh, because when earth runs out, where are they gonna expand to? They're gonna expand uh, in the heavens, people. <laughs> uh, okay, verse 29 now. Yes, what shall they do which are baptized for the dead, if the dead rise not at all. Why are they then baptized for the dead? Now this is a verse in the Bible that I'm not really sure of. Why would you baptize somebody for the dead? I know the Mormons do it. They're the only ones uh, that does this and uh, that do this. But anyway, uh, it seems to me that a person who has died and you're gonna baptize for him or for them is vain. But that was a practice of the early church. See, Paul is not setting forth any new doctrine, but he is talking about what people did in that day, and he's making a comparison uh, that if they do not baptize for the dead, then they don't believe that Christ rose from the dead. But if they do baptize for the dead, it's indicative of the fact that they baptize uh, for the dead, you see. So this is a pagan practice. And it's a practice that we should not even do today. Only the Mormons do that. The Mormons, uh, by the way, the Mormons are so, uh, I, I won't say it, but the Mormons had a hard time um, believing, making priests out of black folks, the black people in the church of priests. Let me say that all Jacob's sent descendants of Jacob are black. All Christ, people, pictures all over the ancient world, pictures in Europe depicts Christ as black. So you believe what you want to, and I believe what I want to, and let them believe what they want to. There's nothing wrong with black folk. I've been black all my life. Let us pray. Father, I thank you for the lesson today. I thank you uh, for the understanding also. And I thank you for a good, gracious, tremendous response. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Now you can join in with us. You can join. We're going to have uh, snippets. And you can enjoy those snippets. Matter of fact, I think next week that's what I'll do. But I'm telling you, if you don't have a place for your kids for summer camp, consider Spirit Field Ministry Summer Camp. Uh, it's a nominal amount that you pay. In other words, we don't charge like other summer camps. And um, you, my wife, she is uh, the director of the program. You can contact us at 706-763-5555. Uh, 
nine 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 seven six three nine 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 nine. I'm Dr. Wayne Baker. Saying so long, and may God rest and bless you. See you again next week. Hello, everyone. I want to introduce you to my new book, The Curse of Ham Revisited. Now you can get this book on my website at drwaynebaker.com. It's a great book. Everyone should have it in their library. That's drwaynebaker.com. Spearfield is a church that is definitely family oriented and we believe in being together. When you're at Spiritfield, you're at a place where you never ever feel alone. There's always someone either praying for you, checking on you, making sure you're good, and also spiritually feeding you. So we're thankful to have a pastor like Pastor Wayne D. Baker, who definitely teaches from the heart as well as from a place of education and higher learning. We're grateful to have that because he breaks down the word into a place in which you and I can understand and be able to add it to our practical lives every day, I'm telling you. So listen, if you now don't have a church home and you're looking for a place to settle and looking for a place to join and be a part of a family, please come see us at Spearfield Ministries, where it will be the end of your search for a friendly church. Spearfield Ministries, the end of your search for a friendly church. We are located at 3898 Mulberry Drive, which intersects with Morris Road in Columbus, Georgia. Services begin at 10 a.m. on Sunday and Wednesday night Bible study at 7 p.m. You may also watch our services on YouTube and follow us on our social media platforms, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Hashtag FF Ministries GA. You may also contact us by calling 706 562 0071 or via email at FF Ministries GA at gmail.com. We hope to see you there.